Hi. So the last um, primitive that we will cover is polygons. So we've gone from points to lines to triangles to quads, and now we're going to do polygons. So polygons are just a more general form of these kinds of shape. So polygons are a many-sided closed figure. It's composed of line segments. No curves, no circles, it's line segments. And to make these in OpenGL, um, we're processing, again, we begin shapes. We begin shape story, and we begin polygon. Now, the first mistake people make, it's not plural. And we'll see why in a moment. So you begin your shape and you add a vertex. You add a vertex. Okay, and you, you just keep adding vertices until your polygon is done. And then you end shape. So what happens is, um, here, you can have as many as you like. Whoops. You can have as, there's some problem with this pen today, as many as you like. And it'll just give you one polygon. There's no command for next polygon, nothing like that. Okay, so that's it. So I'm going to do a demo um, sketch. Let's put that in here. Demo sketch four. See if I can bring that up. Here we go. So this is a good sketch. Uh, we just have some hard-coded data. I've now used two-dimensional arrays um, to put the points list in. And here's a bunch of points um, and a bunch of data set. So what this demo does is just goes through a series of shapes um, and draws them, polygons, and, sees, and shows us how the fill kind of works. So that's all that it works, and I hit the, if I, I, I get the event listener for key press. If it's a space bar, then it cycles through the shapes. Uh, no big deal. Let's see it start up. Okay, so here's a polygon perfect. It's a lot of points, more than a quad, and it's convex as we can see, and it draws and fills perfectly. And here's we're lucky to see that a concave polygon, this is concave a little and concave a lot, also draws well. well. Star draws well, the bow tie. So this is clever, interesting because it actually crosses over. Um, so this is a complex polygon because it crosses over and it still draws correctly. And this is a different bow tie with different ordering. It still draws, draws correctly. And this is a really strange one that'll come back up into slides in a bit. This also draws um, correctly. This one we just call a mess. It's a bit of a, ran a series of really random points. And it looks really strange, but we'll learn in the next unit why some areas are filled and some are not. But hey, it seems to draw. We don't know, but draws OK. Um, cool. And we can even have polygons with holes in it, and it draws OK. So I'm actually going to make a comment here. The fact that this is performing so well, it isn't because OpenGL is so robust. It turns out that processing has done some extra work for us to make this work. Um, just like with the quads, this depends on the OpenGL implementation and the library that you're using. We really can't rely on um, filling of polygons with graphic libraries unless you're very careful and know a lot of detail about the, um, about the implementation that you're using. Back to my notes. Okay. So to repeat what I said in the demo, different implementations fill polygons differently. In fact, many uh, implementations do not support 
polygons because of this difficulty. In the next unit, when we learn about filling, um, we'll learn more about why that might be. Um, but for now, we should realize that polygons, just like quads, they're tricky. They're tricksy. You can't really trust them, okay? Um, so try to avoid them if you can. But I'll come back to that. I'm going to show a slide. Let's see. Ba -bum. There we go. Here's an example. So polygons, this is a con concave polygon. And you see it gets really tricky, right? Polygons can do anything. This is a complex one where it crosses itself. And then you can see in this implementation, it's drawing certain things um, in certain holes and uh, filling certain holes rather not filling other ones. And yeah, it gets kind of tricky and it's actually quite complicated. But we'll come back to that later. OK. So just like um, your other shapes, Polygons have some, they can be, um, they can be convex. Okay, they can be concave. And just like with quads, these are called simple polygons. Uh, they can be complex which means they cross each other and have edges uh, going off in the, in the space, things like that. They can also be degenerate, where they have all kinds of weird, um, all kinds of weird properties that make it difficult to, to draw them. Just like with our other shapes, we can use the cross product to test to help classify them. OK. Um, so here's an example. I'm going to draw this here. This is a polygon that you could imagine putting into OpenGL. And here we have this crossing. And then if we did, and I'm showing this example to highlight um, how difficult it is to use the cross product, because in this case here, all of our cross products will be will be counterclockwise. Right? Because it goes left, 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 left. All goes counterclockwise. But it's you can see that it's complex. So therefore, checking pairs. Um, of adjacent uh, edge vectors doesn't always work. It doesn't always find them. Also, you can imagine a case like this where you have, let's see if I can get this right. Oops. Yeah, I'm not sure why that eraser keeps coming up. Um, let's see if I can draw this right. There we go. And this is the winding here. So you can imagine this case here where um, you have these cases here where you have a change of direction. Whereas with quads, if you had that, um, it could it, you meant that it was convex because it changed, you have these double change direction. With polygons, if you have these two changes of direction, it doesn't mean that it's complex. So if we have two mismatched cross products, Right? They're going left, and then here it goes left, and then it goes right. Opposite directions, mismatched. Left, 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 left. Oh, right again, and left. When we had two mismatched before, it told us that it was complex. But in this case, it's not complex. We can see it. It's just concave. Right? So two mismatched cross products could mean concave. OK? So I'm going to show a slide. 
We already saw this one. Here's another other examples of degenerate um, polygons. One, two, three, four, five, five points and no area. This one has lots of points and two areas that probably should be filled, but sections with no area. Polygons, man, they're complicated, and it's hard to think of all um, all the cases you might come across. So, yeah, and I'm gonna. Oh, I think it's a good opportunity also to come back to the demo I showed earlier. This one here. Let's run this again, and you can see all these cases. And um, like I told you before, you can't rely on your video library to draw them correctly, except for this concave shape. This one, you can't rely on it, just like the quads we saw. This one, even though processing is doing such a wonderful job, if you toss this into regular OpenGL in like C++ or Java, you're less likely to get this result. And here's the case from our slides, right? This is um, that case right there looks a little different, but it has two shaded regions with, an, with a zero area region in the middle, and it drew it just fine. And again, we're going to learn a little bit about why or how processing does that later. But for now, the message is we can't trust them. Even though processing is doing a good job, no one else is probably going to. They're complicated. They're slow. We don't like polygons. We like triangles. Okay. I will mention this important point that you can tell to test if your polygon is safe. If you have all matching cross products, just like with the other shapes, then you have a concave shape. And the reason is because if all your cross products are counterclockwise, then you're just turning. You're not turning the other way. You're always turning in the same direction. If all your cross products are clockwise, you're always turning in the other direction. So this is a problem. Um, polygons are bad. We shouldn't be doing them. So what do we do? What do we do in the real world? We don't use polygons. <laughs> so that's easy to say, Jim, but someone just handed me a bunch of polygons. What do I do? Well, you, you can convert, you should convert your polygons, and I would say your quads too, into triangles. This is a special case of a, of a challenge called tessellation. Okay, this is a, a special case of tessellation where the challenge is to cover a surface with a shape. In this case, you want to cover everything with triangles. So how do you do that? If I'm telling you, let's not use polygons. They're bad, they're expensive, they're hard to do well. Use triangles. Well, luckily, there are lots of nice algorithms to tessellate your polygons, and I'm going to teach you one it's called the ear uh, ear clipping polygon uh, ear clipping algorithm. Okay, ear clipping. So it's the ear clipping algorithm. Let's try that. Okay. So this is a really simple algorithm that at first looks a little overwhelming, but it, what's, what's nice about it is it breaks down into a few simple cases where you're basically finding triangles and chopping them off the polygon, chop, 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 until there's no triangles left. So let me, um, I think it's better to, to demonstrate this with, with slides. Where are my slides? There they are. So I'm going to demonstrate this with slides. So here's a polygon. So the ear clipping algorithm is we first go through each vertex in order. Okay, we find a vertex. And then we, we, we check it. Let's say I'm at VI. We go, are we at a concave point? Well, to figure out if I'm at a concave point or not, I look at my neighbors, right? And here, using cross products, I can find out that, yes, indeed, I am at a concave point, right? Cross products can tell me the winding. I can tell which way it's facing. It's a concave point. No big deal. So if it's concave, perfect. I skip, OK? Ooh. My notes just jumped, um, like to the very top. All right, has a lot of notes. So, okay, we're back. Um, if it's concave, you skip it because you can't clip this one. So we move on. Let's pick another one. Let's look at this one here. Is it convex? It sure is. Bam, bam. 
great. So let's make a triangle with its neighbors, plus one and minus one, right? So the next neighbors make a triangle. And then we find out, hey, are there any other points within my triangle? If there's another point within my triangle, I can't clip this off because I'm going to make a mistake. I can't turn this into a triangle. So I've got to skip this one too. Here, let me re reiterate what I just said. Here, I made a triangle with the one before and the one after. And then I tested all the other vertices. Are you inside my triangle? If someone's inside my triangle, then I, th I have this blank region here, so I can't turn this into a triangle in my shape. And this will make more sense after the next example. Let's look at this one. I'm convex. Yes, I am convex. Good. I look at, I make a triangle with the neighbors before and after, and there are nobody else in here. There's no other buddies inside this triangle, no other vertices. So I can cut this off the shape. So I don't actually get rid of it because we don't want to ruin our shape, but I can cut this off my shape and put it in a triangle list to draw later and then, and then repeat my algorithm. If you do this, you'll get a list of triangles that you clip, 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 clip off your polygon. And when you're done, you'll result in a list of triangles that reproduce your algorithm. So I take this, I remember this triangle, this is a good one, I'll draw you later, I clip it off, and I, and I repeat. So I'm not going to read over this slide, but if you want to implement this, um, this is a good slide. It's actually pretty easy to implement a few tricky points uh, with the cross product, but you can figure it out. So the ear clipping algorithm is a pretty simple way to figure out, um, to turn my polygon excuse me, to turn my polygon into um, a series of triangles. And then if I've done that, good. I no longer need to worry about my polygon. Now, there's one thing, if you're paying attention, that, we might, that you might have noticed we missed in my, my algorithm. I said, let's go back to this step here. I said, make a triangle, good and then check if all any vertice is inside my triangle. But how on earth do I find out if a point is in a triangle or not? We haven't learned that yet. So I'm going to briefly show you an algorithm for determining whether or not a point is inside a triangle. And lucky for us, it's really simple. Um, so I did slides 12 to 18. Okay, so let's talk about the point in triangle test, okay? So I'm going to explain to you how to determine whether a point is in a triangle or not. So let's draw this triangle over here. Great. And I have two points, P inside and Q outside. Comes back to our cross products. If this is V1, V2, V3, counterclockwise winding. This is my edge vector one. This is my um, edge vector two. And this is my edge vector three. Okay, cool. So it looks familiar so far. So this is what I do. First, I draw a vector from V1 to my point. Okay, and then I test. I test out. I go if edge vector one cross product and I'm going to call that vector a1 doesn't really matter but if cross product a1 so I check that and in this case you can see that it's to my left of my my e1 it's to the left it's counterclockwise so in this case it's bigger than zero if it's bigger than zero in this case that's counterclockwise and if E2, I'm going to make some space. And if E2 has a similar property, there we go. If E2 cross product A2, where A2 is the vertices from vector 2, so uh, to the P, so the same thing. I'll look at that E, and bam, it moves in. You can see that it, it's on the same side as the other one. It's to the left of it. It's counterclockwise. So it's also bigger than zero. And if E3 cross product A3, where A3 is this one. Again, E3 is in the bottom. I didn't draw the arrows in there. Let me fix that. E3 is this way. It's to, my, to its left. It's the same direction. 
So if it's bigger than zero, then they're all counterclockwise, and therefore the P must be inside the tri triangle. Then P is inside the triangle. Cool. Now let's look at Q for a second. For Q, now if I just do it in my head, you can see that when I draw the vector from V1 to Q, it's no longer to the left of E, it's to the right. It's clockwise of E. So then even though um, you can, I'll do that first. So E1 cross with Q is going to be less than zero. It's clockwise, okay? So even though Q is counterclockwise for E2, if you look at that, and E3, yeah, it's counterclockwise, those two will be fine. The E1 is going to be less than zero, therefore Q is outside of the triangle. So this is actually really cool. Um, and this is, it might seem like a lot of work, but graphics cards and computers are really, really optimized to, to do these cross products, okay? And so they can do them very, very quickly. So more generally, we can generalize this. All three results, by all three here, um, we mean these ones, okay? All three results must have the same sign. And that counts for counterclockwise winding, clockwise winding, it doesn't matter. If any is different, if any mismatch, then the point is outside the triangle. There are two other special cases I'd like to show. If So we've talked about if the cross product is bigger than zero or less than zero, but what happens if the cross product is zero? So if one is zero, if one of our cross products is zero, then P is on a line. And if two are zero, then P is on a vertex. It's right on the edge. Okay, so it's that simple. Uh, um, you can do a couple of uh, cross product, I should say, three cross product tests, and then you can quickly determine whether or not a point is inside a triangle. So here's a, a slide on that. So you can see the exact same demonstration I gave here. Um, E1 counterclockwise to A1, E2 counterclockwise to A2, E3 counterclockwise to A3. So it's inside. For the P out, E3 is, even though E1 counterclockwise to A4, good, E T E um, um, they're in the opposite direction. Yeah. I'm confused. Oh, I figured it out, yeah. Even though, uh, if I drew, because we only drew the one orange line, that's what confused me, yeah. E1, if we drew a line to P out, it would be counterclockwise fit. If we drew a line from V2 to P out, it would be counterclockwise, but then E3, is clockwise, so it's a mismatch. Therefore, it's outside of the um, outside of the triangle. So that's it. You can now know how to determine whether a point is inside a triangle or not.